Good afternoon. Thank you all in the audience for sharing your name and where you're coming in from today. Uh, this session is titled Trailblazers and Entrepreneurs that Reimagine Their Working Lives. My name is Carrie maltzby Lutz. Pronouns are she, her. I'm the director of the CTA. You probably heard that earlier if you were on. And I'm just excited to moderate this conversation today. It's the one that I was like, I have to do this um, out of all the conversations because these I know each of these women personally. I met Christian just actually through reaching out. So that's a newer acquaintance, but just um, really big fans of the work. And it's, um, you know, they're working in different areas. Um, you know, slightly even, you know, some of the same audience actually, but um, just really wanted to bring these dynamic people together uh, today because I think they have int inspiring stories, um, ones that we can learn about with resilience, about ways that we can prepare ourselves to really uh, go after our purpose. And um, so I have a few questions prepared for the speakers and then I'll open it up to Q&A. So feel free at any point to you can use the Q&A box that's um, within the platform, or you can just drop your comments or questions to directly into the chat thread. So we're gonna get started with introductions. Um, instead of me reading your bios, which are, would take quite a while because you all have done some really wonderful things, I just wanna hear from you directly. So uh, maybe in like 60 seconds to 90 seconds, uh, share your name, pronoun, uh, and your, your elevator pitch. Um, so I'm going to pass this off to you, Michelle, because I know you actually teach on here. <laughs> We're going to start with, with the coach. Um, you can just popcorn it to whoever you want after that. Absolutely. Thank you, Carrie. And, and thank you and welcome, everybody. Super excited about today's conversation. And Carrie, you know how they say those who teach or the people who are in marketing sometimes are the worst at this. So I don't need, I, I don't know if it's going to be 60 or 90. It might be a little shorter, but um, definitely jump in and of course, I uh, always put my best foot forward. But as you mentioned, I'm, I'm Michelle Matos. My pronouns are she, her, ella. And I am the founder and CEO of the Matos Method. And through the Matos Method, I provide purpose-driven professional and personal development services that are focused on maximizing your potential and well-being or an organization's potential and well-being um, through customized coaching. And that could be one-on-one -on -one or, or again, uh, for the company, um, really centered on women of color um, and really rooted in empowerment and connecting to the passions and values that contribute to creating a balanced, meaningful life, both in and outside of the workplace. Um, and that's something that I'm really passionate about and super important uh, and central to, to the work and services that I provide. Um, in addition to entrepreneurship, this, this new journey and phase in, in my career and life, um, in the field, you know, I bring over 20 years of experience in, in business and, and nonprofit management. Um, and I will, I will stop there because I think we're going to share a lot throughout our time together. So I will pass it to Krishan. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you, Carrie, for this uh, amazing invitation. And I'm so looking forward to this conversation. I'm Krishan Wright. I'm the host of the Blacks the Global podcast and the founder of Blacks the Global. My pronouns are she and her. Blacks the Global exists to empower and inspire members of the African diaspora to pursue a life abroad. And I am joining you today from, well, it's now evening in Portugal, um, and I'm on my scouting trip. So um, as part of the platform, it's really being able to open a welcoming space for those who are looking to move abroad, also information for people who are currently abroad, and then those who repatriate, those who start off abroad and then choose to come back to their homeland. So looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Marta Hernandez, I'm an East Oakland native. I'm a serial entrepreneur and an artist, um, singer, songwriter, um, author. I've started two companies that I'm really proud of. Uh, the first company I started is um, HR as a service for small to medium sized businesses. We have customers across the nation, a tech team that's global. The second company I'm uh, excited about uh, is the most recent ESO Ventures, and we build entrepreneurs where they're at, specifically black and brown. Excellent. You all have been 
great job on the elevator pitches. They were succinct. We got a great idea of what you're doing, your vision and, vision and your mission. Um, so we'll just dive into the questions because I do want to leave time for um, the audience. Uh, so we're talking a lot about purpose. That's, you know, a part of the, co the conference title and why we're here today. What called you to entrepreneurship and what earlier life experiences played a role in your desire to blaze your own path? Um, and let's start with uh, Krishan. Thanks for the question. Um, I started my career, at, my career is not linear <laughs> in any stretch of the imagination. I spent 10 years working in New York State politics, New York State government. I worked in television. I was a lobbyist, migrated to digital marketing, and then ultimately entrepreneurship. Um, and I think for me, there was always that underpinning, that desire of wanting to start my own thing, but recognizing that in some ways it was circumstances, um, bills to pay, children to feed, things of that nature that um, you know made that a little bit more challenging. But ultimately, I had a series of layoffs. Um, the first one was really during the downturn in 2008. And then, you know, once you cross that first one, the rest get a little easier. Uh, and so when it happened again, I didn't, I was in a better situation and I wasn't fearful. I was able to lean into it and say, okay, instead of running and looking for a job, what do I, Krishan, want to do? What is what is going to be the thing that lights me up every day because you have to be really clear about your why. And then also how can I serve? And so with this last one, it was 2020, we all know what 2020 was. And um, with everything that was going on, I started to feel um, closed off, you know, social distancing, racial unrest, uh, as I mentioned, a job layoff. And I was sinking into this feeling of you know, really depression and wanted to redirect that energy and channel it into something positive. And that's when I came up with the idea of the platform for Blacks the Global and the podcast, because I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm going to make this journey in 2023. And maybe there are other people that are feeling like me. Maybe there are other people who feel like there's something else out there. They don't know quite what, they just have this feeling inside, maybe not have a language for it, or maybe they do and they just need a safe space. And so that journey, again, if I could look at it, you know, almost two years ago and see where it has brought me to date, I would not have imagined this for myself. It's been um, definitely a welcome thing, but I think that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. It's really taking that step, not knowing where it might lead you. Oh, that was that was beautiful. I loved the part about leaning into the layoff that second time and feeling ready and just a life of service. Um, mm -hmm. So and thank you. I was actually a part of Blacks at Global, and that's how I came across Krishan's, um, you know, the work that she's doing. So I, I directly benefited from from that. So excellent. Um, how about you, Martha? Let's pop to you. Thank you. Um, so. I don't think I, I, I mean, I knew that I was an entrepreneur early on. I grew up in a small town in Mexico, even though I was born in Oakland. And in my little town, um, entrepreneurship was survival. And so for my sisters, my mom and I to think about ways in which we could be creative and still be able to survive economically, we started selling chicken outside our house. So we had a little assembly line. I was seven at the time. We didn't have what most kids have, right? Ability to play and um, have weekends off. We were working. So at an early age, I understood the empowerment of building something, but didn't really realize that until I want to say my mid um, uh, 20s that I had ideas that essentially my you know, supervisors had to water down. <laughs> um, and I had to write a white paper for everything on why I wanted to implement something. I was rapidly promoted. I did really well, but I still felt like senior leadership, executive management, vice presidents, et cetera, still question a lot of my, um, uh, of what I brought to the table. And it wasn't until 
I was at a senior uh, role myself um, and really managing a really large department for uh, one of the largest independent grocery chains um, in, in the U.S. that I realized I'm making this white guy richer. Like all these things that I'm bringing to the table, like I could be doing it for myself and then support other entrepreneurs, other businesses to implement the practices that I'm coming up with. So that's really when it, you know, it, it was sort of a aha moment that I wanted to have independence and that I, I knew I had a value that I could bring to others. And I just needed to make sure that I understood like how to do it. But that was really the initial piece um, coupled with the purpose, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I want to be able to be financially sustained and sustain and sustain myself. But the purpose, it was when I actually started making money through my businesses. Mm-hmm. So the idea itself of wanting to be an entrepreneur didn't actually bring a real um, value, real value to the, my customers and to myself until I realized why I was actually doing it. And the reason I was doing it is because I found my calling and that was helping people be from where they were to where they could be, um, whether it was the individual employee all the way to the actual business owner. So that's when it actually just be, just happened, right? Like, oh, customers came walking through the door and I didn't even have to do any marketing and people recommending me left and right. And like, I'm cashing checks. It wasn't until I realized it's about the people. And that's the real focus um, that made my purpose come alive. I love that, centering the people. And it's true, you're like just a, a people empowerer you know, from the work that you do in uh, recruitment and, you know, placement to now helping entrepreneurs not be just surviving entrepreneurs, like you saw as a young person, but actually thriving entrepreneurs. So talk about purpose. Thank you. Um, Last but not least, Matos. Thank you. And I resonate so much with what Martha shared. Um, So I just want to echo a lot of, of what you shared, Martha, and thank you so much really inspired me and in just hearing you and, and you as well, uh, uh, Krishan, with, with um, your experiences. You know, I too was raised in an entrepreneurial family. Um, I like to say I was raised by entrepreneurial matriarchs, uh, in particular, my mother and grandmother. And it was just part of the fabric of, of my family, of my community, growing up in Union City, New Jersey with, you know, first generation immigrant family, parents who were very working class, who you know, did not graduate from high school, did not have a college education in, in, you know, our countries of origin. And so entrepreneurship was a survival method, right? Um, It was a way to supplement what was a lot of minimum wage work. And so early on as, as a child, I saw that. And that's something, that ability to create something really interested me. And I, you know, got to work with my mom and some of her side businesses. And as I got older, that spirit stayed with me. Um, And it has really always shown up as a passion and desire to create joyful, empowered experiences, um, in particular for people and women of color. And Carrie, you know me from years ago, you know, I've had that entrepreneurial bug in me and earlier in life, it, it showed up as food and restaurants and wanting to create not just a menu of food, but connecting uh, my Afro-Caribbean culture through food and music and create a whole experience where people left feeling centered and and just like reconnected to self. And, um, you know, that still might happen in the future. Uh, But more recently, how entrepreneurship really showed up for me was really in my own life-changing experience and working with this amazing coach uh, who was referred to me by by a close friend. Um, and that experience really just opened up my eyes in helping, helping to make that connection for me between the work that we did together in, in our coaching time and how empowered and fulfilled and clear I felt about the next steps that I wanted to take in my life, um, along with my professional development and experience 
and the work that I was already doing pro bono in particular with women of color around that, that professional development. And so it really was kind of putting those pieces together for me. I want to say maybe a year or right before the pandemic happened. Um, and so as I was embracing this calling, it really was recognizing within me throughout my life, looking at my family, the matriarchs, right? A lot of the community work that I did, you know, was always centered around communities of color and in particular women of color. Um, just really connecting to that, that passion and joy that I feel inside that's so important to me, which is about witnessing women of color connect to their power, developing a sense of purpose, acting with clarity, right? Believing that we all have the capacity to shape our own lives and reimagine our collective futures. And, and that's really what was ignited in me that really led me to launch, to launch my own business, which was to formalize something that I had been doing for some time and really connecting uh, to that, to that calling. So that's, that's a bit about my, my, my journey and how I got here. So thank you. Great question. Yeah, that's great. I, I love, um, the fact that you raised, um, you know, about entrepreneurship and just kind of being a creative pursuit, you know, and kind of making something from nothing. And, uh, you know, and Mar Mata, you mentioned you're an artist and I feel like most entrepreneurs are, you know, at heart, it's that artist, you know, it's blank canvas and, and, you know, imagining something that's not there. Um, and so, you know, Michelle, maybe I can, you know, I know you just uh, answered last, but I feel like maybe you can, kind of talk more specifically about how you, um, you know, prepared for taking the leap into entrepreneurship, because as much as I've always known, like you are going to be an entrepreneur, like that's, you know, I, you know, when you just know someone and you, you know, you feel that is what their ethos is. Um, I also uh, know that there was a process to it. You know, some people leap into entrepreneurship out of necessity, you know, Krishan mentioned um, it was a second layoff, you know, and so mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if we can get a little nuance around how you prepared to take that leap. And if maybe Mata or Krishan after wants to talk about, you know, how it was different when you kind of are more, uh, you know, thrown into it. So. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a question um, that I get asked a lot. I think there's a lot of curiosity around that. Um, and, you know, some of the questions come from my community, right? So, you know, the decision to step away from the job security that I had, right, which partly means predictable income, benefits, right, that can be a scary move. And also, personally, um, you know, I was on a leadership track, I wasn't on an aggressive leadership track, um, I had made director at a Fortune 9 company, which is really hard to do in a short time frame, especially if you're a person of color, if you're a woman of color, um, you know, those, I believe those spaces are not really built for us. They're not built by us and they're not built for us. So there was a lot that I had accomplished, right? And I am an achievement oriented person. And so it wasn't just walking away from those tangible benefits, but it was also coming to terms with some of my own ways that those environments had served me or fostered or enabled some of those perfectionist tendencies that, that, you know, that, that live within me. I call myself a recovering perfectionist now. Um, so there were, there were a lot of steps and time that it took for me to, to, to get the strength and courage to take this step, right? So it, it took a couple of years, um, you know, and colleagues of mine and friends, dear friends of mine and my board of directors know that I officially launched in April of 2021. So I was part of the great resignation, but the, I had been planning this two years before that, right? And part of that again was my internal process and coming to terms with some of the things that I mentioned, but it was also the responsibility and pressures that I felt, some of them self-induced, some of them society, some of them family, around the fact that I was the first graduate, the first undergraduate, the first person with a master's in the family, the first person to be in a leadership role and a homeowner. And, you know, there's a lot of pride attached to that because my parents, in particular, my, my matriarch, 
right? They really worked hard and made a lot of sacrifices so that younger people in the family like me could have these opportunities. And so there were a lot of things that I needed to face and, you know, kind of work through to get here. Um, But I had a lot of support along the way. And that's really important. You know, I had my personal board of directors and Carrie, you're part of that. And there's a couple of folks on here who are too, uh, like my dear friend Rosa, who, who worked at the company with me and just others who really supported me throughout the way and were a sounding board, um, you know, through the hopes and fears, but also through the marketing plan and the business development. Right. And so tapping into that was really important. I also really needed to focus on my well-being um, and you know, my, my, my emotional and physical health had taken a toll from the stress that I was under, not only from the work, but also from finding myself living not authentically in that environment and the level of compartmentalization that I felt I had to create to perform and to be promoted and, and to, you know, really survive right in that environment. And so there was a lot of unlearning and undoing that I had to do. And so it was really a combination of that well-being and support for myself, personal board of directors, and really equally important, a financial plan, right? So as I mentioned with my family, you know, I am the high, I was the highest earner. And so, you know, I didn't have, you know, family helping me out with it. You know, I wasn't raising funds to launch this. This is a self-funded endeavor. And so I had to also come up with a financial plan to save so that I was, you know, fine for a year, right. To give myself time to ramp up the business. And so there were a lot of things that, that I put in place to, to help me uh, launch to, to take this leap. Right. And, And it's still a journey. So I'm now officially passed the first year and entering the second year. And there's a whole host of opportunities and challenges and learnings along the way. Um, And I think, uh, you know, Krishan mentioned something to the effect, I'm going to paraphrase, but this is kind of a journey. You don't really know where you're going to land ultimately. And so still going through that, but that's, that's really some of the ways in which I had to and chose to, to prepare for this next chapter. Excellent. And I'm glad you did because you are mm-hmm. empowering so many women, including myself. So thank you. Thank you um, what I heard was the personal board of directors being a big one and just your wellness, your inner self and that financial plan piece. So I appreciate you speaking to that. Um, Krishan or Marta, any thoughts on, you know, how you uh, order fell? Yeah. Yeah, no, what Michelle said, I resonated with on so many levels, Um, just being, you know, coming from different spaces, especially in corporate and, you know, having this um, internal drive and and being the first, it's hard to give all that up. You know, there's a lot of attachment to it. Obviously, there's a financial benefit. There's a personal attachment either to colleagues or where you think you are aspiring to, particularly if you're the first in your family. And then, you know, as as Michelle mentioned, your family has made a number of sacrifices in order to help you get to a, a certain place. And then there's that internal conflict of, you know, am I throwing this away, even if they meet all these sacrifices, am I being selfish? So there's a lot of internal work that happens and and kudos to you for for being able to do that in preparation for that. For me, it's kind of like building the plane as I fly it, right? In in the sense that I'm I'm working through that as I'm building it. Um, But I think the, the, the steps are still the same, just in a different order. Um, so I think that for me, that's the, the part that resonates the most. It's just understanding that there is no one path toward entrepreneurship. There is no one journey. Um, and so for some people, it, it, it what looks like hap- what happens overnight and an overnight success is really months and years of planning and hand holding and you know and saying why am i doing this and and all of the things and then also the successes you know be it uh, albeit big or small right you need to be able to um sit in that and appreciate it because it is something that you created right and as women and as women of color being able to lean into that and that ownership and it's like you realize the impact that you have on someone that you didn't know, you may not have known before, 
but there's something that you said or did that inspired them to, to do something that they never thought either they could do because somebody told them or something that they felt inside. But whatever it is that you did, you showed that light that allowed them to make that next right move for them. And that's something that's hugely powerful. Beautiful. Martha. Yeah, I think what I would add is, you know, this question that I've been sort of tackling with as we were building ESO Ventures, which is an organization to support, right, the, the, the incubation of entrepreneurs. Um, and that's that, you know, I believe that anyone can become an entrepreneur. Unfortunately, traditionally, entrepreneurship has not been accessible to everyone because it takes from idea all the way to potentially making something, right? Like on average, black and brown founders were making 20000 a year as entrepreneurs. So who in the world will want to do that? It's not worthwhile, right? It's ridiculous. We give up. Of course, we're not going to be generating wealth and creating wealth in our communities because it takes so much to become an entrepreneur and to grow as an entrepreneur. So I think what I want to share today is that there is clearly no specific formula on how to become an entrepreneur or even to identify whether or not you should go into entrepreneurship. What I can say is that when you have a great idea, when you already know people willing to buy your product or your service, and you have an appetite okay, for risk, because you may have everything else and not have the appetite for risk, then it may be your time to think about it. Um, I get people that ask me, hey, Marta, I, I want to pick your brain about, you know, I, I'm thinking about starting this thing. And um, I, I usually ask, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? And when people say to me, I want, you know, flexibility, I want to be my own boss, I want to, um, to be able to do what I want, then my answer is then don't do entrepreneurship because that sounds like unemployment to me. Entrepreneurship is a lot of work. It's weekends, it's nights, it's anxiety, it's not knowing if you're going to be able to pay yourself, it's until you're at a, on a path to be able to grow, then that's a little different. Then you have access to knowledgeable people and therefore you can sleep, right? Like, oh, I know I can call an attorney. I don't have to worry about it right now. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a process. It's a road. It's, it's connecting with people who know how to do this thing. And it comes with time. So as outside of being an expert in what you do, learning the business and how to become a business owner itself is a journey and a process. I love it. Thank you, Marta. That was well said. Said like a mini Michael Bush, you know, back in the day, <laughs> just tell it like it is, get a job because you're not, if you want work-life balance. Um, and uh, Martha, or Martha, I'm going to throw it back at you, um, you know, because you brought up even the importance of capital and how so many of our black and brown businesses in particular don't have that. And that's the one of the key challenges. Um, ESO Ventures um, raised $8 million this past year. Um, first year operating, just kind of like a unicorn in a sense for when we think about like a community focused organization. Um, I just would love for you to just talk about how that opportunity came into existence and um, how you envision it supporting uh, the black and brown entrepreneurs um, from East Oakland and those folks like, like them. Yeah. You know, I love when, uh, I don't know if it was you, Michelle, or Sean that said it's not an overnight success that's I, it was probably you Christian like people see that oh all of a sudden you get eight million right it's <laughs> shocking but I've been at it for a long time my partner Alfredo has been at it for a long time my partner Ben has been at it for a, a long time even with an MBA from Stanford right like still struggling to raise capital in Silicon Valley. So mm -hmm. we got lucky, 
But man, it was years and years of cultivating relationships that were willing to bet for us because they knew we had done something right. And when I say we had done something right, um, I started working in the ESO idea with Ben and Alfredo, and I didn't get paid for over a year and a half, right? So what was I willing to do? It wasn't, we didn't start with the idea of building a business. I started with the idea of supporting other people like me who didn't have access to capital to make sure that that entrepreneurship was worthwhile for them. So I could share my truth because I'd been at it for three years. I couldn't raise capital. Only Latina in Oakland, probably in, uh, in, in my zip code that has a tech startup um, monetizing, growing, right? We have some investors and, and still like in a place where I, I'm not, I don't feel like I've reached that moment. Um, but with ESO, we did. We reached that moment. In fact, I think we have some haters out there saying, why are the new kids in the block getting this money? We've been at it for so long. We, we've built this you know, organization and we haven't gotten that level of investment from the state. And this is where I think it's important to understand the difference between doing something for a long time and just going at it with a different perspective and with the right intention. We began supporting entrepreneurs, right? I began that as an advisor free of charge because I wanted to do something good for my community, East Oakland. That's how it started. When you have, again, right purpose, right intention, the universe will see you. And I feel like the universe saw us. We've been at it for a long time. So we're now in a position where we're building really outside of the body. People say we're a little crazy the way in which we're building our uh, capital solutions um, that are outside of the traditional format in which black and brown people access funding. And the beauty of that is we can do that because we don't have those strings attached to money that comes from investors that are typically on your board and then they dictate terms. We are di dictating those terms. The entrepreneurs, everything is informed by the entrepreneurs. So, you know, this is where I get really excited about being visionary thinking outside the box, we wrote freaking legislation. That's how we got the money, right? Mm -hmm. That's thinking outside the box. It's saying we deserve this. Traditionally, you haven't done the work for us. So we're willing to do that. We didn't go for a nonprofit. We went for a for-profit. Why? Because we believe that entrepreneurship, investing in black and brown founders should not be charity. It is a business decision. It is lucrative and it's sustainable and it is just the right thing to do, especially for East Oakland. And this is where we're started. So that's where we're at, Carrie. We're, we're excited. We're launching products now. We're on our fourth cohort. Um, we're about to fa finalize our fourth cohort, over a hundred entrepreneurs going through our programming and it's just here and, and we're expanding. So that's, that's, you know, that's really exciting. Y'all are just doing so many great things. Really the dream team. And I love that you showed it might look overnight, but it's not. You all have been doing this work for a long time. And the right, and that's, you know, and it came through and that's why you were able to get legislation. I remember writing the letters in support and, you know. You were at it from the beginning. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was there. So it's just been a lovely watching it. Um, so Krishan, I'm going to pop this back to you. It's kind of, it's a two-part question. Um, sure you know, regarding technology and, um, you know, just shifting workplace norms, individual expectations. And I would love for you to define and tell us about the digital nomad movement. Um, some people heard about it, but they don't know, quite know what it is. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the digital nomads, uh, they're, they're a fun bunch, <laughs> which I, I claim, you know, uh, a, a slight uh, area in it. So digital nomads are people who just kind of buck the whole traditional, you know, nine to five cubicle, sit behind a desk, you know, really taking ownership of, you know, when they work, where they work, in particular, the emphasis on where. And so some of that was spurred, you know, by the gig economy, people making a decision, you know, to, to do some side work or freelance work that ultimately in some cases became their full-time job or another venture. But it's this ability to say, hey, you know what? I like, I'm not a morning person. 
So I work, my zone of genius really kind of starts to light up around two o'clock. And so they're seeking opportunities that fit the way that they like to work if they want to work at all. There might be, you know, a time where they're saying, hey, you know what, I want to take December off or every other month. And so really being able to carve out a lifestyle that complements who you are as a, a person. And I, I think it was Michelle had mentioned earlier about having that that more of an integration, right? So not compartmentalizing yourself, being able to show up. And when you're able to show up and do the work as your full self, that's when you're you're really in that zone of genius. That's when you're working as your your best self. Everything starts to align. And you know, it might be the tough days, right? But you're able to to tackle it and confront it. And so that's the thing that you know, digital nomads, I think really that's what propels them. And it's not an age-based thing. You know, some people think, oh, it's the youngins, it's the millennials. And it's like, look, I'm almost 48 years old and I claim myself to be a digital nomad. <laughs> um, and I've had the opportunity to work, you know, whether it be in a different country like I am now or in a different state when I'm back in the United States. And I really live into and lean into that lifestyle. You know, I have a child at home who's about to uh, go into her senior year of high school in the fall and a, and a little pandemic pup, you know? <laughs> and so being able to direct my day and even how I show up in my community is really, you know, something that I hold true to me. I don't want to compare myself to someone else who's doing it, you know, every day they're going live or every other weekend or every weekend. I just know for me and mine, I can't do that. So I show up when it works best for me. And when I show up, I know I'm giving it 110%. And so that's the beauty of this digital nomad movement, that it is all inclusive, that it is that it does allow you that ability to direct not only your day, but also what comes in your pocket. And so that's the thing that I love the most about it. Excellent. Sounds like that's like almost the middle space of, you know, if you want to be the entrepreneur and you want flexibility, maybe you find the right organization that enables you to have that. So it kind of feels like you're an entrepreneur. But um, so just to the audience, you know, maybe there, there, there's that middle ground. Um, you know, and part two of the question is um, specifically around the concept of a black sit. Um, I would love for you to define that and talk about um, why it's resonating with so many Black folks around the world? Yes. So I think, you know, Black people are tired <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're a Black American in the United States or you are it from uh, Liverpool. It doesn't really matter where. I think the common thread is that there is a calling on your heart that says, I think that there's more. And that's the thing that I think has propelled the movement. And that is why I didn't want to be so myopic and create Blacks at Global. I, I intentionally put the word global because I didn't want it to be so focused on people defaulting and thinking, oh, it's it's Black Americans, you know, because of, you know, uh, slavery and, and systemic racism. And these are the people that are fleeing. No, <laughs> even in my time in Portugal last night, I was at an event and I met a, a Black Italian. He's on his scouting trip. <laughs> a woman from Liverpool, she's on her scouting trip. So her second day in Lisbon. And just being able to be in fellowship and know that, yes, as Black people, we have that commonality, but that story, it, it might be different because of, you know, your upbringing and things like that. But obviously, there is something that's calling you to a different level of purpose, a different level of fulfillment. And for those of the, us that are in the United States, again, talked about 2020 at the start of the conversation, it was a heavy year. And obviously there's a lot of work that continues to be done. But the thing that keep in mind is not only did those occurrences happen in the United States, but it resonated on a global level, a global level across colors. And so I feel that this movement is, you know, is our generation, our time on this earth to pick up and, and start anew, wherever that new is. It could be, well, like I said, I'm in Portugal. It could be anywhere. Um, but I think that, 
you know, as Black people, we have migrated and we're members of that the diaspora. Our spores are sprinkled all over this planet. So there isn't a place that we can't inhabit. It doesn't mean that you have to go, oh, to the continent of Africa. There's nothing wrong with that. My brother was just on his scouting trip two weeks ago <laughs> and uh, he just had the best time in South Africa. And it, it, it doesn't matter where it just, and you don't have to do it at all. For everyone, it's gonna look a little different. Um, but I think there's some power in being able to lean in and direct your life in a different way, very similar to our conversation about taking ownership of your future and saying, hey, I wanna be an entrepreneur. I wanna go with the passion that sits within me to help people in a different way. And what I found to be true in the black expat community is that people have made their own private decisions to make that leap. But what I see is also the common thread is that they give back. You know, they're creating these platforms, whether it's an app or last night having, you know, a diaspora Thursday at Sophia's place in Lisbon or going or Saturday, I'm going to a meetup for black in Portugal. And so all of these things, it's like people aren't just going to their respective new country and saying, hey, you know what? I'm here. I'm free. I'm away from wherever it was that I wanted to avoid and escape. No, they're lighting the path. They're building a bridge so that other people can find community, can uh, feel welcomed, and to flourish in a new way. So that, I think, is really the, the power of the movement and, and that it's accessible. You don't have to be a celebrity. You don't have to have millions of dollars to do it. All you have to do is be able to you know, do your due diligence and research and, again, find that community and tap in and get in where you fit in. I love it. You are inspiring us to want to just get our next flight out of town, at least for me. And it's so true that uh, the community gives back. Um, that's what I was so impressed with is, you know, posting questions about what's it like being Black in Croatia and all the people sharing their experiences and, you know, really a community of giving. Um, that was powerful. Uh, so, uh, Michelle, uh, let's move to you. Um, and I wanted to ask a question because you work with so many uh, different women leaders and um, people that are uh, emerging, just the real, you know, the gamut. And I'm just wondering what kind of themes uh, that you have uh, seen manifesting within, you know, spe specifically to the, the pandemic um, around careers, leadership, personal shifts, um, in particular with, with women of color. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. I, you know, something that Krishan said really stuck with me and resonated with me, which I think summarizes the rest of what I will share, which is self-direction. And there is a real desire in the work that I do um, to be more self-directed in what a career looks like, in how we show up as leaders, what our life looks like. And that is a breaking away from the status quo, right? That is, that is in contradiction to, right, a lot of workspaces. There's a lot of change happening. There are a lot of trailblazers. Companies are reimagining, rethinking, absolutely. And there's still a lot of work to do, right? And so now with the pandemic, with the, you know, the racial and social injustice and violences that we've been seeing forever, especially amplified and exasperated in these past two years, right? There's just a lot that has come to the surface where in general, the women that I work with are like, I'm just not, I don't want to do what I've been doing. I don't want to keep participating or showing up in these ways that don't really resonate with me. And yet, <laughs> right, I like my career or I like what I'm doing or, you know, I, you know, have to financially sustain myself and my family, or I want to continue to grow, or, you know, I want to stay where I am, but I also want to explore um, different streams of revenue, right? And so people are really reimagining and rethinking what their life looks like, what their career looks like, and how they show up as leaders. So those are big themes. And the other thing is really dealing with burnout, right? And identifying it and naming it, you know, which is not something that I think we talk about openly, right? I think we are expected to show up and perform 
right? And just, you know, you're a mom, you have children, what happened to childcare, the support, but you've got to show up and be like, hey, ready to go, right? And I think that that's been what we've all lived through. Um, and not just in corporate spaces, right? I think that that exists in different spaces too, including nonprofits, right? And I think that that coming to terms of like, I am burnt out, right? And then realizing, oh, this isn't like a one week, hey, we're going to take a retreat and then I come back refreshed or like, hey, a week of vacation and I'm good to go. It's like, no, things have to fundamentally shift, right? The support in my life, resources, you know, career, what's available to me, um, you know, showing up authentically, what does that mean, right? Is where I am now a safe space for me to do that? Or is it not, right? And if it's not, then what does that mean? And so it's a lot of, again, just that, that, that awareness, that awakening, the clarity, the support, the thinking through creating plans um, that are doable and realistic, right? And then like, what's the support? So those are some of the themes that really pop up and, and resonate. I think just self-direction, not wanting to do things as, as they've been done because they, they're not working right? They're not working. So that that's a lot of, of what, what comes up in our work together. It's like a career exit plan. Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's a career exit plan. I mean, I think it's like a massive exit plan of like yeah, exiting right. how we've had to show up, right? Into like, how do we want to show up now? And part of it is you know, I try to be mindful, uh, yes, self-direction, but also there is only so much that self can do, right? Yes. Because if self is trying to do all of these things in systems or structures that do not support that, that also can be very harming to the person, right? And so it's also about thinking what, what does the person need and want? Like, what does it look like to thrive in this new imagined self, right? What does the person need community-wise, support-wise? Is it staying where you are? Is it looking somewhere else? Okay, well, what does that look like, right? So it's definitely a journey and a process in time. Um, but I, I, I think yes, self, of course, and the broader to make it all happen. I love that you mentioned the system, which is why I was like, 32 hour work week. Yes, <laughs> got to get that going because I can't do this. Anymore. Yeah, because when I hear four day work weeks, not the 32 hour, I like that. I like that level of specificity because I hear all the, oh, four day work week. I'm like, no. you know what I'm hearing? You want work. me to cram 13 hours a day in those four days no. to come up with the day that I'm not there, right? So it's like being really intentional yep. about yep. what we actually really want and creating that. Yep. So I, I love that. Yeah. About the 32 hour, 80% less. Um, so I had one more question, but I, since we're, you know, 10 minutes out, I want to actually give the audience time uh, to, to ask their questions. Cause I've seen some stuff, you know, comments here that are great. And actually let me go and check the Q and a and see if we have some things um, we actually do. Um, so someone who's anonymous asked about what are your thoughts on, creating a small business for skills such as sewing that are harder to find a job for. My mom is 58, does not fully understand English, unemployed and widowed since 2008. So I've been financially supporting her since junior year of college. She is a skilled seamstress, helps people with clothing alterations, but I don't know where to start. Mata, do you want to take that one? I'm like, girl, come to I know, school. I was like, <laughs> yes, well, that's I was what like, we do. Um, yeah, so you know, it's I think we get we get overwhelmed by the idea of starting a business because it means paperwork and taxes and license and all that, right? But let's be real. Starting a business is doing something for something and that something is money. Um some it could be other things too. I started like that. I wasn't getting paid. I was actually getting other uh, resources. Um so if your mom is already doing that, is figuring out how much is her time worth and making sure that you're actually bringing some bread, right, on that time that she's investing. I see it with my mom. She's a seamstress, too. And, you know, they love helping people. And I thought, you know, my sister brought something. She's like, oh, you know, my friend needed this to get fixed. And, um, and, I, and then I was like, well, how long did it take you to do that? Oh, it was just 30 minutes. 
But when we start looking at 30 minutes and, you know, five minutes and 20 minutes, and it's already potentially three, four hundred dollars. And we're not thinking about the electricity that you, you know, spent, the um, maybe the water, the usage of your home. So it's being it's starting to think about how much is this worth? And if it's not giving you the return, it's not a business. So let's first think about that, right? Like, is she make is could she make some money on that? And then you start thinking now about the unit of economics, right? Like your point of equilibrium, meaning how much of that, how many of those she needs to do in order to bring a return. And it may be 10 pants and three shirts every week. And you start that simple. Every week, three pants, three shirts is going to bring $150. At the end of the month, it's going to be you know, $500. So it's really th thinking about it tactical that way. And that's the first step. Then we can start working on the rest. I love it. Thank you. And I just linked ESO Ventures. And by the time we're done, I will have linked Matos Method as well as Blacks at Global. I got to go kind of slow so I can also focus. Um, <laughs> this multitasking world. And so there was actually a, a great comment earlier um, in the main the chat stream um, around um, Marlon, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, who quit her job on Monday. Um, congratulations for doing that after, right? Round of applause to, to <laughs> leaping and finding the courage. Um, and Marlon has a question about uh, how do I avoid repeating uh, the same pattern of ending up in high paying roles that don't align with my values. Uh, I feel like Masos, that was maybe meant for you, maybe Krishan too. <laughs> I'm happy to, I'm happy to share the response with Krishan because I can imagine Krishan has a, a very like solid, thoughtful response there too. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's talking about patterns, right? And that is very tempting. And a lot of us face that, right? We left one job, but then what? And I think that's a lot of the emerging conversation and realization now around the great resignation, which is that a lot of us took a step to say, hey, we don't want this. This wasn't working for us, but now what? And how do we not repeat some of those patterns? And, you know, I, I, my, you know, my thought that comes to mind is not, you know, I'm not, I'm not pitching coaching as the only way, but I think working with someone or with an organization or having the support to think through, you know, those patterns and, you know, what are they rooted in and how does that show up for you and ways to start managing and shifting that, right? And what does a new reality look like for you and what do you want and um, what is enough, right, for you to be comfortable, right? I think those are all questions to, to explore um, and that, you know, can be done alone, that can be done in community with your board of directors, that can also be done through, you know, a, a, a coach that's well aligned um, with, with where you want to go. So those are some of the quick, you know, things that come, come to mind for me, but, you know, would love to hear if Martha, yeah, Krishan has other thoughts to share as well. I, I, I would love to share, like, from a practicability standpoint, right, is that, um, Sometimes we just, how do I explain this? So there is, um, I think there's a movement to, to, to do the thing that you love, like that you're passionate about and live in purpose, right? But it doesn't have to be the whole thing all the time. There may be, there may be the situation where maybe the job is not where you're fully living your purpose. And let's just be practical because what may be available may be that high paying job that allows you to do the things you want to do in life and live your purpose. So in, in, I think what I want to highlight is the balance of that. If you're 100% in this job that does not provide you living with your purpose, does not give you the time to do the things you love, to explore, to grow, then that's what needs to be evaluated. But maybe it's looking at it from a diversified approach. I have my 20% of the shit I hate to do, excuse my language, but I'm going to do it because it brings me results. And I tell you that from a working out perspective, I hate burpees. I wish I didn't have to do them, but they produce results. So I do them. That's a good 10% of my workout, right? So sometimes we have to do some things we don't always like but we got to balance it with 
all the things we love to do. And so that may be a job and a bunch of other things, family, travel, um, you know, freelancing, uh, et cetera, you name it. So I just want us to remind, you know, each other that it doesn't have to be a black and white, that we can coexist in all of these different things. And there are a lot of businesses out there that need you. So go get that money, girl. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to, you know, I think it's a, you can go into it with a what's in it for me. You know, we talked about authenticity. We talked about, you know, the path to entrepreneurship doesn't look the same for everyone. Uh, and so it doesn't have to be, you know, an all in. You can get that that ship close to the dock before you take that full step, right? So you don't end up in the water. There's no shame in that. And so if you can find a job that one, is not a toxic work environment for sure. Two, that allows you to show up as your best self. And maybe that is just understanding that, hey, it's the consistent income. It's the days off because as an entrepreneur, that is a little harder to navigate at times and just look at it. This is what it serves this purpose for me at this particular time right now. I made that decision. I have no shame in it. I have to pay college tuition <laughs> in, in the next year, right? But I went into it with a what's in it for me? What do I need right now? And if there is anything that goes on the I do not like list, which is a toxic work environment, a, a, a crappy boss or anything that is like on my hard no, I have enough, you know, at, at that again, that consistent income affords a little discretionary income to have a cushion that if anything goes left, I can grab what, you know, severance, whatever I have and hit it, right? So that's the thing. It's just being able to flip it on its head and not think about, you know, oh, I'm being tethered to something and I really want to do this. It's like, no, this is the opportunity. And what does that opportunity do for me? And when you look at it from that perspective, mm -hmm. then you're able to direct the ship in the right way. Oh, man, this conversation, this has just been fire. I love it. You all are just dropping so many gold nuggets. Um, we are almost at time. And I did want to acknowledge someone in the chat earlier that talked about also being a coach, um, used to formerly be a professor, Sweta. I hope I'm, I might not be pronouncing your name correctly, but would love to connect with you. Um, and I'm so glad that, you know, this engagement was here in just in 20 seconds, because we have about that 20 to 30 seconds. What can we do uh, to support you? Because as community members, um, as consumers, um, we need to also support our businesses because it's not going to work if we aren't doing that. So um, I'm, you know, trying to, you know, to your own horn for you, but wanted to give you all, you know, 20, 30 seconds. How can we support you? Let's start with Matos. Yes. Thank you, Carrie. I mean, I, I know it's cliche, but the, the, the like, share, follow, comment, you know, method is definitely great for an emerging, very small business, right? Like, you know, please, I welcome and invite you to check out my website, sign up for any, you know, updates that might be coming up, you know, please follow me on LinkedIn. If, you know, what I shared about my services, my values and approaches of interest of you, or to your organization or somebody else that you might know, you know, would love a referral. Um, you know, I offer complimentary consultations to see, you know, if it's a good fit synergy. So again, just, you know, would, would love support in that way. Thank you, Carrie. Can I sign up for another free consultation? Even though I'm in September. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Krishan, how can we support you? Sure. Listen to the Blacks of Global podcast. Definitely, if you're looking for support, you can join our Passport community. And you can find that at blacksofglobal.com. Of course, follow on the socials. Uh, everything is at Blacks of Global. And uh, looking forward to connecting. And thank you for this great opportunity. This panel is wonderful. And you ladies are just fire. How do you support us? Um, not Marta specifically, but I'm going to call, call you out, Carrie. We never ask for anything free. We always pay. Mm -hmm. I always pay, even if they're like, oh, I'll do it. If it's black and brown, I'm going to pay you. Number two, we give each other business. So if somebody else may have a better price, but we, there's a little that's a higher cost for someone who, you know, is barely getting in the door. So we got to pay that. got to support that. And I think lastly is this is the personal plug. 
Um, if you know of a small business organization, nonprofit that needs some HR support, let us know. That's Made Boss. You know an entrepreneur that has a great idea, wants to build, send them to us. That's ESO Ventures.